Welcome to the third annual Emerging Scholars Symposium, a partnership brought to you specifically by the three presidential libraries, Roosevelt, Truman, and Eisenhower, um, but more broadly by the National Archives and Records Administration, of which the presidential libraries are a part. The Emerging Scholars Symposium is a program that brings you, the viewer, cutting edge insight and information from a group of scholars that are relatively new to the world of research, scholarship, and presentation of their findings on a national stage. We are, um, Getting into uh, and getting in on the ground floor uh, of, of what's going to be some wonderful careers for uh, for many of these researchers uh, in their research and writing. I'm Jeff Urban from the FDR Presidential Library in Hyde Park, New York. I'll be your host and moderator uh, over the next three days, and I'm so pleased that you're taking some time out today to join us. And I'm sure you're going to want to do that for the rest of the week as well because we've got some great uh, scholars uh, for you. Uh, I'm sitting in for my friend and colleague, Joy Murphy, who is the Education Director at the Eisenhower Presidential Library and Museum, who is unexpectedly unable to uh, be here with us this week. And I'm delighted to be bringing you the talented scholars that you're gonna be hearing from this week. And to get us started today, uh, we are going to uh, listen to uh, a talk by uh, author Linda Herview. And Linda is an American writer, journalist and lecturer based in France, where she discovered the story that would lead to her book, Forgotten, the untold story of D-Day's black hero. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, the New York Daily News, the Daily Beast, uh, Time on NBCnews.com, uh, and other publications. And she's spoken at the National African American uh, Museum of History and Culture in Washington, DC, at the National uh, World War II Museum in New Orleans, and the Imperial War Museum in London, and also at many universities, uh, including Harvard, Princeton, and Berkeley. Linda, welcome. Thank you for being here with us today. Please share with us your work. and uh, around the country, uh, researching my book, Forgotten, and the excellent archivists and support staff were invaluable to helping me find material. We are lucky to have these presidential libraries and national archives staffed by such qualified and caring people who work behind the scenes in the back offices, at the security desk, in tech, very important now that we're remote, most of the time, uh, and in the visitor centers to help us preserve and share our history. Yesterday marked the 79th anniversary of D-Day, the Battle of Normandy, an epic battle and an epic gamble. It is fitting that this symposium series is titled Difficult Decisions Beyond the Battlefield. For the one million African-American men and women who served our country during World War II, Theirs was a fight not only against the enemy, but also a fight against their own government, their own military, and often against their fellow citizens who were determined to deny them an equal place. They would fight for the freedom of people abroad in Europe and in the Pacific, and they would do so as second-class citizens. They served in segregated battalions formed under the premise that these humans, these soldiers, were less than qualified, that they were less entitled to respect, and that they did not deserve quality training and proper weapons. The African Americans of World War II were deemed less intelligent and less capable. They would prove their critics wrong. I'd like to share with you a few of their stories, and I'll begin where it all began for me 14 years ago in Normandy, France, on Omaha Beach. This is Omaha Beach in June 2009. For the 65th anniversary of D-Day, the French government honored an American veteran named William Garfield Dabney of Roanoke, Virginia. They gave Bill the Legion of Honor, France's highest decoration for his service 
on June 6, 1944. Bill was a member of the 320th Anti-Aircraft Barrage Balloon Battalion, the only African-American combat unit at D-Day. The men of the 320th were charged with an unusual mission to raise a curtain of silvery balloons from the ground over two of the five invasion beaches in Normandy, Omaha, and Utah. The balloons formed a defensive curtain over the coast to protect the men and materiel from dive bombing German planes. If an enemy plane snagged the cable, it would become trapped as if in a spider's web until it stalled and crashed. The balloons that went to war packed a secret punch. With a cable strike, a small bomb would descend and a good hit could take out a wing or explode the gas tank. Many of us don't remember that the US Army, like much of the United States, was segregated in World War II. And so the 320th was an all black battalion. What did that mean? It meant that the enlisted men and some of the non-commissioned officers were men of color, but the top officers were always white. Bill Dabney received his Legion of Honor medal in Paris. After the ceremony, Bill shook the hands of Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks. Bill liked the attention, but he had no idea who they were until his son Vinny told him, Dad, do you know who those men are? But Bill Dabney knew something. He knew very well that there were no men of color storming Omaha Beach in their movie, Saving Private Ryan. All black veterans know this. In fact, no movies about D-Day show black soldiers in action. Few books about D-Day mentioned the 320th or that there were nearly 2,000 African-American troops on the Normandy beaches by the end of that extraordinary day. The 320th was among two African-American units given a commendation by General Eisenhower for their service, yet we don't know about them. Today, eight years after my book was first published, I am still told, but there were no black soldiers at D-Day. What does it matter that these soldiers were excluded from our collective memory and from so many of our history books? Well, D-Day is one of the most important days of the 20th century. General Eisenhower, the Supreme Allied Commander, and his team of American and British generals knew that if they could get those men onto those beaches and up and over those bluffs, it was only a matter of time until their troops would be marching through Berlin. I would argue that to exclude a significant portion of our population from that legendary battle does the United States a tremendous disservice. The great General Omar Bradley once said that all men who landed on Omaha Beach were heroes, yet there were heroes among the heroes. As I began research into my book, I learned that one of the men of the 320th, a college student, would become a star in Black America and beyond for his service on Omaha Beach. He would be nominated for the Medal of Honor. He would not get it. None of the one million African Americans who served in World War II received America's highest honor until 1997, when President Clinton awarded seven of them. Those awards came after an independent study commissioned by the Army found that pervasive racism within the ranks denied deserving black soldiers the decorations they deserved and the opportunities they deserved. I'd like to tell you about that 320th soldier. His name was Waverly Bernard Woodson, Jr. Waverly Woodson's story is extraordinary, but it began with a simple case of beating the odds. Odds were low that a black soldier would even be in the Normandy landings, but Woodson was used to defying expectations. Woodson left his pre-med studies at Lincoln University in Pennsylvania and enlisted in the Army on December 15, 1942. His younger brother Eugene signed up too and was stationed in Texas with a unit of the Tuskegee Airmen. Their parents in West Philadelphia were beyond proud and the doings of the Woodson brothers were tracked in the black newspapers back home. For Waverly Woodson, the decision to join the Army was not difficult. He wanted to serve his country, but he would be penalized for making this choice, for when he returned home after the war, he was not able to secure a spot in medical school. Despite being a United States veteran, he didn't qualify. There were quotas for black applicants, even if they were heroes. 
There were two armies in America in World War II, black and white. There were two of most things, barracks, mess halls, service clubs, buses, train cars, and berths on ships were divided by race. It was a highly inefficient and extremely expensive way to run an army. Yet there was one sector that was integrated, officer candidate school. The Army didn't think that black men were smart enough to score high enough on the entrance exam, an exam heavily weighted to favor whites, so they didn't bother to set up a separate system. But Woodson passed the test and trained as an anti-aircraft artillery officer. In the end, there were no officer positions available to him. This was a common story for black officers whose service was limited by quotas in the rule that they could not command white officers junior to them. So then Corporal Woodson was assigned to retrain as a medic with the 320th. And that is how Woodson, 21 years old, found himself in the early morning of June 6, 1944, aboard a boat slicing through the rough seas, headed for Omaha Beach. He nearly didn't make it. A shell hit near his boat, sending shards of burning shrapnel raining on deck, Woodson's lower extremities burned. He reached down and pulled up a hand covered in blood. I am dying, he thought. Another medic patched him up, and then Woodson got to work. He landed in the maelstrom that was Omaha Beach, following in the wake of a tank that took a direct hit. He set up a tent roll at the waterline and under relenting, unrelenting enemy fire, and snipers aiming for medics began tending to the shattered men all around him. On Omaha Beach, Corporal Woodson saved drowning men. He patched gaping wounds, extracted bullets, and dispensed blood plasma. He amputated a right foot. Suffering from his own injuries, he worked through the night. On the morning of June 7th, he saved four more drowning men. Waverly Woodson worked for 30 hours before he collapsed from exhaustion and his own wounds. In the months following D-Day, Waverly Woodson was nominated for the Medal of Honor. We know this thanks to a sole piece of paper in the archives at the Truman Library in Independence, Missouri. It is a note from a top aide in the War Department to a top aide in the White House that says, here is a Negro from Philadelphia who has been recommended for a suitable, underlined, award. It continues, this is a big enough award that the president can give it personally, as he has in the case of some white boys. There is no trace of the records that explain what happened to Waverly Woodson's medals. That is not unusual. Only 1% of Army records from World War II exist today. And a fire at the Army's archives in St. Louis, Missouri in 1973 destroyed 80% of personnel records. What we know is this. Woodson got a Purple Heart for his injuries and, belatedly, a Bronze Star for his service on Omaha Beach. To the Army, the note in the Truman Library is hearsay, but there is further proof of Woodson's actions. In the summer of 1944, Woodson was a huge star. The crusading black press hailed him as number one invasion hero. Even white newspapermen came to interview him. Stars and Stripes wrote that Woodson and the medics covered themselves with glory on D-Day. Woodson returned home a celebrity and the accolades continued. He was invited to recount his heroics on a nationwide radio show and the black press began calling on the White House to award him the Medal of Honor. Significantly, stapled to the note in the Truman Library is a press release issued by the Army on August 28, 1944, detailing Woodson's heroism that the Army would praise the individual actions of a black soldier on Omaha Beach was nothing short of extraordinary. In 1994, for the 50th anniversary of D-Day, the French government chose a trio of Americans to honor. They flew them to France and presented them with a palm-sized medal commemorating their service in Normandy. They included Waverly Woodson and his wife, Joanne. I was the only black man of the three, Woodson said proudly. He was 72 years old. Waverly Woodson died on August 12, 2005. His simple white marble grave is at Arlington National Cemetery, where we Americans bury our heroes. 
Through the years, Joanne Woodson would arrange a Memorial Day visit with an armful of the red roses that Waverly, an avid gardener, loved so much. In June 2015, President Obama awarded the Medal of Honor to a black soldier from World War I. I'd like to tell you about him. His name was Henry Johnson. Here is Sergeant Johnson in the slide wearing his French Croix de Guerre, Cross of War Medal. Sergeant Johnson was a member of the legendary Harlem Hellfighters, the 369th Infantry from New York. Johnson single-handedly fought off a German raiding party that attacked the trench he was guarding, using up all of his weapons until all that was left was his bolo knife. The African Americans of World War I suffered extraordinary racism on and off the battlefield. The 369th was handed over to French command. They fought in French uniforms alongside French poilu and received French medals for their extraordinary record. They served more days on the front lines than any other American unit. The French called them the men of bronze. The Germans called them hellfighters for their ferocity in battle. Like Woodson, Henry Johnson's heroics made him a star. Yet Johnson died 11 years after the war in poverty without even a purple heart for his injuries. And so, at that time, no medical benefits to treat those wartime injuries. Eight decades later, after a very long campaign by New York Senator Chuck Schumer's office, President Obama finally awarded the Medal of Honor for Henry Johnson at the White House. The president said, it is never too late to say thank you. Let's step back to 1941. In 1941, when the men of the 320th began receiving their draft notices, the army was a bastion of racism. Its ranks were dominated by Southern commanders who determined that Southern officers like them were best suited to handle black men. So how bad was it for black soldiers? Well, to understand these world, the world these men were thrust into, it's necessary to understand that army policy at the time was a lesson in what happens when racism meets pseudoscience. The science at the time held that black brains were smaller than white brains and sometimes hat size was used to measure this difference. An Army War College study from 1925, still on the books in World War II, was indicative of this type of thinking, the thinking that underpinned Army policy toward the black soldier. This study found the black soldier to be immoral, docile, secretive, lacking the physical courage of the white man. He simply cannot control himself in the face of danger, the study declared. It was an obvious attempt to justify depriving black soldiers of equal opportunity. One of the men who got one of those draft notices in June 1941 was a soft-spoken 21-year-old in Atlantic City, New Jersey, named Wilson Caldwell Monk. For Monk, being drafted meant a steady paycheck. The $30 he would earn monthly in the Army was a measure of security he very much needed. In Atlantic City, the country's first planned resort town, there were three months to earn your money by stringing together as many jobs as you could before Labor Day when the curtain fell and Atlantic City shut up tight. The odds of getting a decent job during the long cold winter were slight. At that time, America was not at war, so Wilson Monk expected a one-year commitment. He was in for a surprise, an even bigger surprise, when he boarded a train and headed south to his first Army training camp. Somewhere north of Washington, D.C., Monk was told he had to switch to the Negro car. He had no idea what that meant. The Negro car was always hard by the noisy, dirty coal engine. So a soldier in uniform would end up wherever he was going, covered in soot. The train south was the first taste of Jim Crow for the North's black recruits, who would arrive at their first day of boot camp already fuming. Jim Crow, as you know, was a series of laws in the southern United States that ensured the separation of the races. What you may not know is that they included such crimes as pretending to be a white man. After the Civil War, Jim Crow law spread throughout the South like a poisonous weed so that by 1890, the races were effectively separate and black men and women had to step off sidewalks and avert their eyes when passing whites. Wilson Monk was stationed at Camp Tyson, an army base built in northwestern Tennessee for the purpose of teaching men to fly barrage balloons. Of the 30 or so units that trained at Tyson, four battalions were black. 
Sergeant Samuel Madison of Columbus, Ohio, described his treatment there this way. We were like little dogs. He would be court-martialed more than once for failing to take the beatings and the humiliation. Tempers were often at a boiling point at Camp Tyson, and Wilson Monk wrote to his mother that he feared a riot after a 320th soldier named Herman Hank Hankins was shot in the back by a white soldier. It was an incident that was never investigated. Wilson Monk showed me a photo of Hankins' grave, and he wondered if Hankins' family ever learned the truth about how he died. One day in the spring of 1943, Wilson Monk and some friends boarded a train and headed to Memphis on a weekend pass. Their first stop was a diner where a monk asked for change to play the jukebox. The man behind the counter threw back a handful of nickels and told Monk, if you wasn't in uniform, you wouldn't get a damn thing from me. What Monk learned was that wearing the uniform of the United States Army usually posed problems for black soldiers among Southern whites who saw a proud display of patriotism by a black man as a provocation. And it only got worse. Later, Monk and his friends went looking for a place to grab a bite. Outside one restaurant, they watched, incredulous, as a long line of German prisoners of war filed inside. Black men were not welcome there. There were 425,000 German and Italian prisoners of war interned in the United States during World War II, most of them at army bases in the South, where they were accorded privileges denied to black soldiers. In fact, that these enemy prisoners enjoyed often backslapping treatment by their white guards was extremely painful to soldiers like Wilson Monk, who, even seven decades after the war, recounted it to me with fresh hurt. Yet despite that hurt and despite the vicious treatment they endured, Monk and his fellow soldiers served our country with distinction, and they were not alone. This is Doris Miller. Dory was the first hero of World War II, the first hero. The Navy initially did not want to recognize him and suppress the story of his heroism at Pearl Harbor. As the Japanese sneak attack got underway, Miller, a cook aboard the USS West Virginia, jumped behind an anti-aircraft artillery gun and began firing into the skies over Hawaii. He took out a few Japanese planes with guns he had never been trained to use. Fifteen men were awarded the Medal of Honor for their service on December 7, 1941, including the mortally wounded commander of the ship, whom Miller had dragged to safety. But not Miller. He got the Navy Cross, which at that time was third place. The Navy did feature Miller in a 1943 recruiting poster, but he was never promoted. He was still working as a cook aboard the carrier Lycombe Bay in November 1943 when the ship was struck by a Japanese torpedo and sunk. Of the 900 men aboard, 272 survived, but not Dory Miller. The 761st Tank Battalion, the Black Panthers, fought in five countries and captured 30 towns. The 183 days they served in combat was more than any other unit. Their commander, General George S. Patton Jr., made it clear what was expected of them. Everyone has their eyes on you, Patton told them. Most of all, your race. Don't let them down. The Panthers won many decorations, including 11 silver stars. But they would have to wait until 1978 for, the dis for their distinguished unit citation given to them by President Jimmy Carter. America's first black pilots of the 332nd Fighter Group and the 99th Fighter Squadron spent the war treated like pariahs, as Airman Lee Archer put it. Denied proper training and ignored by their commanders, they still went on to fly more than 15,000 individual sorties. The bomber pilots escorted by the red-tailed planes had no idea that the men who led them to safety were black. Today, the Tuskegee Airmen are well known but it wasn't until a TV movie aired in 1995 that brought their story back into our popular consciousness. The 92nd Infantry Division, with heroic roots dating back to the 19th century Buffalo soldiers, were vilified during World War II. They were called incompetent and cowardly, yet their record reveals otherwise. In July 1944, one of their regiments, the 366, was sent to mount a high-stakes frontal assault on seasoned German troops in Italy. 
They had only a few days training in inferior weapons. Their commander, General Ed Edward Allman, had greeted their arrival with these words, I did not send for you. Your Negro newspapers, Negro politicians, and white friends have insisted on you seeing combat, and I shall see that you get combat and your share of casualties. And so, despite suffering 3,000 casualties, and despite a system that shortchanged black soldiers, the men of the 92nd collected scores of decorations, including 208 silver stars and 1,000 bronze stars. After Germany's surprise attack in the Battle of the, Bul of the Bulge in Belgium left 80,000 Americans killed, wounded, or captured, more than 2,000 black service troops answered an urgent call for volunteer riflemen. Many of them were in labor and service units that black soldiers were assigned to in disproportionate numbers, and they took demotions for the chance to fight. They impressed their white commanders with their ferocity and drive. Although assigned to segregated platoons, they were the first men of color to fight shoulder to shoulder with white men since the Revolutionary War. One general told them, I have never seen any soldiers who perform better in combat than you have. Yet many men wouldn't see the medals they were due until years after the war. Two New York vets waited until the year 2000 for their bronze stars. There were many stories like these. African Americans served with valor, wherever they were stationed. And not just black men, more than 4,000 women of color served in World War II. African American women served in the Red Cross and the Women's Army Corps. They worked as nurses and clerks, and some 800 of them were sent overseas to deliver tons of backed up mail to 7 million American soldiers. They were the six triple eights, the 688th Central Postal Directory Battalion the first battalion of black women and the only female black battalion to serve in Europe. And lest you think sorting mail, tons of backlog mail was an easy job, the women of the six triple eights would set you straight. They worked in shifts round the clock, seven days a week, while billeted in an old school in Birmingham, England, with cold showers and beds on the floor. They endured the same indignities as their male counterparts with a mighty dose of sexism to boot. They were curiosities, oddities to white male soldiers and officers who came to stare at them. The first time they marched through the streets of Birmingham in their crisp uniforms, cream-colored gloves, and berets they called hobby hats, they were nervous. Back home, it was only derision they experienced. But to the English, they were VIPs. The applause and even the whistles brought tears to many eyes. They thought we were beautiful, recalled Private First Class Gladys Thomas Anderson. Later. Thomas and her battalion mates were barred from a local swimming pool at the request of the Americans. On the subject of decorations of the D-Day veterans I interviewed, Bill Dabney was not the only one to receive the French Legion of Honor. Henry Parham of Pittsburgh got one too in June 2013 at a ceremony at the French Embassy in Washington, D.C. Henry Parham called his service on Omaha Beach a privilege, even though he said, we were treated like second-class citizens. I found 12 survivors of the 320th to interview from my book. Henry Parham was the last one to leave us. He passed away on Independence Day, July 4th, 2021. But his wife, the fabulous Ethel, is still with us. Before I leave you, I'd like to share a story of hope that is perhaps instructive today. In our time, a time of great division with protests roiling our cities and people crying out to be recognized as equal citizens with equal rights. It is interesting to note how the African Americans of World War II who were marginalized and reviled in many corners of their own land were treated abroad. After leaving Tennessee, the men of the 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion boarded train cars headed for New York where they trudged aboard the Acatania a luxury liner that was converted into a troop carrier. It was one of the three fastest ships in the world, packed with thousands of young Americans and Canadians. They docked in Scotland in November 1943, and for the next seven months in the villages of England and Wales, they would enjoy liberties that they had never thought possible. In this land, white people were happy to meet them, share their meager war rations, and forge lasting relationships.
In Britain, black servicemen and women were Americans first with funny accents and bright, white, bewildering smiles. In a nation made gray by the drudgery of war, their presence was incandescent. It was like Hollywood came to town, a man in Wales named Ken Clark told me. Ken was a boy when one day hundreds of black GIs arrived, and he has never forgotten them. The importance of these experiences abroad for hundreds of thousands of black GIs cannot be overemphasized. It was epic. It was through their time abroad in Europe, in the Pacific, even in occupied Germany, that African Americans like Wilson Monk, Waverly Woodson, Henry Parham, and Bill Dabney learned that race hatred was not a natural state of affairs. These wartime experiences abroad would help shape the budding American civil rights movement that would rock our country in the decades to come. Before leaving for Normandy, our man from Atlantic City, Sergeant Wilson Monk, was billeted in the hall of a stately, stately stone church called Trinity Methodist in the village of Abersuchen in southern Wales. One day, he asked the church organist if he and his friends might attend Sunday services. Of course you can, said the organist, Jeffrey Pryor. Pryor, who was also the village milkman, had no idea that back home, none of these men would have stepped foot in a white church. Then Pryor did the homesick GI one better. He introduced him to his wife, Jessie. The Pryor's 18-year-old son, Keith, was off fighting with the British forces, and Wilson Monk became their surrogate son. Like most Britons, the Pryors had never met a person of color until the Americans came, and they in turn were the first white people whom Wilson had ever called his friends. And so an extraordinary correspondence began between Jesse Pryor in Wales and Wilson Monk's mother, Rosita, in Atlantic City. And I'll end by sharing one of my favorite of those letters with you. This is a picture of Jesse Pryor. My dear Mrs. Monk, how are you? I expect you will be very surprised receiving this letter from me. I feel I must write you and tell you how very delighted we are meeting Wilson and having him in our home. Mrs. Monk, you have a son to treasure and feel very proud of. We love him very dearly and will do anything in the world for him. All you regret is we cannot have him home more, but duties won't allow. He does come as often as possible. We have told him he can look upon our home as his home while he is in our country. And I will try to fill your place, if only in a small way. But don't worry too much about him while he is here. We shall take every care of him. If ever he is ill or in any way wanting us, we shall be there. We look upon him now as our own. Mother, mother, mother to mother, very sincerely with loving thoughts, Jesse Pryor, XXXXX. Wilson Monk and his war bride Martina were married for 60 years. One last note about Waverly Woodson. This is a page from my website. A bipartisan coalition of senators and congressmen led by Senator Chris Van Hollen of Maryland has introduced bills in the Senate and the House to award the Medal of Honor to Waverly Woodson. They have appealed directly to the Secretary of the Army to support the medal. If you support this action, please consider asking your representatives and senators to support it. And the homepage of my website links to a petition started by the Woodson family. You could add your name to it with a couple of clicks. Thank you for your attention. So you, you say you got the idea for this um, about uh, 14 years ago at the 65th um, anniversary. Um, what what exactly about uh, being at the 65th anniversary of the, the of the Normandy invasion got you interested in this in this group of men in this topic? Well, thanks, Jeff. Um, the the 65th anniversary of D-Day was the big blowout anniversary in France. The French government did not was anticipating that by 70, we would not have many of these men left with us. And they were right. So they used 65 
for the big anniversary, and everyone was there, presidents, our president, Obama, um, the queen, uh, the German chancellor for the first time was there. It was a very, very big deal, but there was only one American honored, and that is uh, that was Bill Dabney, the one I showed you at the beginning with the wearing his Medal of Honor in his backyard in Roanoke, Virginia for me. Um, so I met Bill at that event, and we American reporters, well, not just American reporters, but we all wrote about him. Um, the story of the 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion was also interesting to us because many of us had never known that the U.S. Army was segregated. Um, most of us had never learned about the history of our own country and in that detail, and we didn't know this. And so we were all fascinated. And then there were these crazy balloons. We were all like, what? Like the British knew about these balloons. And if you've watched uh, any war movies that based in, in London, for instance, you see these giant balloons floating. But we didn't know that the United States Army had a barrage balloon program. And also that these balloons, giant ones, were uh, guarding our coasts, especially the West Coast, where along uh, range assault from the Japanese was feared. And before uh, the U.S. realized that Germany was not developing a long-range bomber that could hit our East Coast, the balloons were there as well. And so we were fascinated by these. And this idea that there were bombs attached to these smaller balloons that went to war. Um, and Bill Dabney was just such a character. Bill could tell a story. Bill could hold a room. He was just one of the nicest, nicest people I've ever met always smiling. And Bill just told this story so well. And I wrote a story for the New York Daily News. Uh, I'd worked as a, uh, an editor at the Daily News for a long time, and I wrote for them in France. And I thought it was a shame to just do a, a single story about them. And so I asked a friend in New York, um, do you think a magazine would want something on these men? And he said, well, I think that's a whole book. And I thought, well, I don't know that it's a book. And so anyway, I eventually started researching it and it did become a book uh, five years later. So that's how that all started. That's great, that's great. Um, I'm, I would like to welcome everybody that's watching. Uh, if you have a question, you can put it in the comments. And if not, I, I have another one for you, Linda. Now the, the 320th um, Barrage Balloon Battalion, this was a, a unit that was all African Americans Yes, uh, except for top officers. Okay, and these guys, I mean, these guys must have had nerves of steel, right? I mean, these were the first guys, correct me if I'm wrong, these were the first guys on the beach. There's no cover. Um, they're out there with these incredibly dangerous uh, balloons, right? Because these things were filled not with helium, but with, with hydrogen, which is explosive. explosive uh, yeah. there, do you think there was a an element of racism in that. Let's let's put these guys on the beach first and and see what happens. And why, why no, was it? It was, it was actually the opposite. So we don't know why. You know, there were about thirty four barrage balloon battalions, four of of which were were all black. Uh, the first barrage balloon battalions to land in a battle were the were were white battalions that landed in uh, the fall of 1943 in the Italian campaign. And the balloons had worked out so well in that campaign that they decided to have uh, a barrage balloon battalion land uh, in, in the D-Day landings that everybody knew was eventually coming. Why they picked a black unit, we don't know. But I think, right, there's hypotheses. And the one that I tend to go with is thanks to the First Lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, who worked very hard, very hard and very prominently to get and lobbied her husband to get black soldiers more responsibility. Uh, there were a lot of, um, a lot of uh, pressure groups, which is the precursor name to civil rights groups, um, pushing her to help the black soldier and she was all for it. Um, and so I suspect that that is why uh, an African-American unit was chosen for this campaign. Um, when, the thing you need to understand about barrage balloons is they cannot go up until all of the small arms fire is down. So there were balloons floating over the ships to protect them, but when the men stormed the beach, the men of the, of the 
320th were with the infantry. They were in uh, groups of three and four, and they were storming the beaches, Omaha and Utah, with the infantry. And they worked in those initial hours like infantry soldiers. They rounded up German prisoners. Um, but their job was not to get off the beach. Their job was to stay on the beach. And so uh, while you still had all that uh, sniper fire and all that, they were uh, digging um, foxholes and they were they were burrowing in and they would stay on the beaches uh, until the shipping uh, into the Normandy beaches ended in the fall. They would also advance along the coast uh, in, in Normandy on uh, the peninsula with um, with the uh, with the infantry forces also. And so yes, but it was it was dangerous. Um, you have to understand, these men learned how to make hydrogen, and apparently that's not so hard to do. <laughs> we could go in the kitchen here maybe and see if we could whip some up. I mean, it's not that hard, um, but it's super dangerous, right? It's, it's And we all know what, what happened to some of the blimps. The blimps differing from barrage balloons in that the blimps had a cockpit and were flown as airships. These balloons were raised from a winch from the ground. Um, and they were absolutely terrifying to German planes. Uh, there was a really good disinformation campaign going um, by our side. And so they didn't know what those cables, what, what surprises might, might be had if they nicked one of those cables. Um, and so they were, um, they were seen as highly effective. Interesting. Any questions coming in? So when you interviewed these men, now you said um, um, the one gentleman was, was quite a character. H how did they view their, their role in all of this? I mean, did, 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 they, did they see themselves as the heroes that they are, or was it just typical of so many men of that, that generation of, well, we were just doing what we were told, we were just doing our job, we were just doing our, our duty? H how, did they, how did they view themselves in this? Well, those of us who have talk to veterans and or who have family members who are veterans know that these men do not want to talk about what they did. Um, I was lucky in that even though I wish I had learned about this 10 years earlier when we still had many of these men with us, uh, they were ready. Many of them were ready to talk. I mean, Bill Dabney was always up for telling a story. Um, and you can see him, by the way, in a time life um, documentary called The African Americans of D-Day when he tells his story. There's also a trailer, a very short trailer on my website where you can hear their voices. And when you hear Bill Dabney speaking, um, there's music in the background. That is from, I was allowed to use that bit for my book trailer. And you can hear their voices. And no, um, the difference with African American men um, is that they really did not think anybody cared about what they did, um, pointedly because they were black and because they carried so many memories um, of how, of, of all the, the terrible things they experienced. I mean, you have to remember some of these men, like one man um, from Baltimore told me, I was too scared to leave the base in Tennessee. Paris, Tennessee is where that base was. He said, because we had heard about chain gangs, we had heard about black men being picked up and disappearing um, and being charged with some false crime and then being put on a chain gang. He said, I was terrified to be in the South, absolutely terrified. And so you had these differences. Sam Madison from Columbus, whose picture you saw, uh, was a fighter and a child who was orphaned, uh, raised on the streets and was tough as nails and he wasn't taking it. And even though he was court-martialed twice, he still rose to sergeant. He was just thrilled to pieces to tell his story. Um, when I reached Wilson Monk in Silver Spring, Maryland, the man from Atlantic City, he had been living in Silver Spring, um, he said to me, I've been waiting for 50 years for this phone call. And that wasn't 100% true. His kids um, he had two kids, uh, they tried to get it out of him, but he wasn't ready to tell that story. And so with age brought, um, I, I think when we're confronted with our mortality and you have to remember the ages here. And when I met Bill Dabney, he was 89 and he was the baby of the battalion. In fact, he wasn't old enough 
to um, to fight, but he had his grandmother forge papers uh, back in Roanoke because he didn't want to be the one left home. He thought all the girls would think he wasn't capable, so he didn't want to be left behind. <laughs> and that was Bill. Like, Bill would always tell a story that way. Um, Bill was on Omaha Beach. I mean, he was a, he was a sergeant. And he must have been tough as nails, but he told those stories with a smile. Others, not so much. I mean, Henry Parham uh, in Pittsburgh clearly had a lot of pain um, about the time he spent in the Army and the treatment. He was very soft-spoken. He was the go-to D-Day veteran in Pittsburgh for the news media. When they needed a, a D-Day veteran, they would call Henry. Um, I don't believe they ever spoke in any detail about the barrage balloon program, though. They just liked the fact that he was at D-Day. Um, and one thing that broke my heart a bit when I talked to Henry was that, you know, he said, you know, they would always invite me, but they would never even pay my parking. And um, yeah, so I think that I was surprised at how willing these men were to talk to me. I mean, not at first so much, but because I had to learn details about what they did you can never rely on memory when you're writing about history. Any historian, and many historians told me this, um, but I would find details. Like when I found a picture of the ship, the Aquitania, and when I found the name of the ship, and when I found the convoy records for that trek across the Atlantic at College Park, Maryland, in the National Archives, that was a huge eureka moment because then I could go to them um, with the name, and that triggered a lot of memories that matched. Um, that journey was harrowing for them. It's the closest that um, this book gets to being a thriller. <laughs> they survive, but um, you know, imagine German subs, U-boats, trekking the North Atlantic, looking for ships just like this one to sink, and the boat tacking because they didn't have uh, radar to really spot those subs. And so it was harrowing for these men. And something happens in that journey that I talk about. Um, but it was like that. It was piecing it together. So as they got to know me, when I would visit, I would do a circuit, I would be at the National Archives, and I would add on, you know, Clarksburg, Maryland, Pittsburgh, Columbus, Roanoke, and then the Carolinas, as I found more men. And I would always bring them something new, and they got to know me. And those that were comfortable and had the hearing to talk on the phone, like Wilson Monk, we would talk all the time. And um, I became very close to them. And so um, even though materials were hard to find, there had to be a way to find a way to write the book because I didn't want to let them down. I, I think that's one of the most interesting things about your book is it really, um, I mean, the topic, of course, is, is fascinating. But you, you do such a great job. Uh, and you can see in, in your book your, your journalism background and also your photography background because you really don't let the story lie. You, you continue, you go, you dig deeper, you, know, you, you take that lead and you run with it. And that's really what I think pulls the whole thing together. And, you know, it's it's not only that, but it's also this ability to paint this this picture of of not just what they were doing, but what they were feeling and what they were they were experiencing. And one of the things I find so amazing is the difference between how they were treated in England and how they were treated uh, here. Can, can you share a little bit more about that with us? Well, I was fascinated by the, the Britain experience because I didn't know anything about this. And there are a couple books written uh, in Britain by British historians um, because you have to understand that the American invasion of uh, the British Isles in World War II was, was truly epic. Uh, the, the island just about heaved. Um, someone, some general said that. Um, because there were so many Americans there and they really changed the landscape. And then when um, the black uh, soldiers arrived, that was uh, extraordinary because many Britons had never met a person who wasn't white and they were just superstars. And I do mean superstars. There was a pecking order of uh, people you wanted to invite to your house to dinner. And remember, they had very little. They were rationing 
in war, a lot of the Americans showed up and thought that it was very old fashioned in Britain and the clothes and the food was terrible and they had almost nothing. And a lot of the Americans were, were totally appalled by this. But the black Americans who had been in the South um, understood this because a lot of them had come from the same um, the same economic circumstances as the, the British countryside. And they were so grateful for the reception. And they were also, they had Southern manners. They were the African-Americans. They were very popular. And so this created a lot of tension in the towns uh, where they were billeted. Not tensions among the British, tensions among the white Americans who did not want them and could not conceive of the fact that they were invited in, that they were uh, allowed into dances um, and they could dance with women. I mean, this was huge and this created so much strife. And I spent a couple of weeks in the National Archives in, in, in outside London and there's just files, files, tons of files just compiled on what was what the British were were going to do about the problems the Americans were causing and what the foreign office wanted in the colonial office, right? Because Br the British empire had a colonial office. And so the colonial office was very much uh, an advocate for uh, the, the, the rights of the African-Americans pushing that the British not um, give in to American demands, the individual American commander's demands that they segregate their towns. General Eisenhower was quite explicit that there be no segregation. He knew exactly how this was gonna play among the British people. And that if this happened, the British people would turn against the white American soldiers and they absolutely did. And that chapter um, of my book, A Taste of Freedom, um, which is self-contained. You can just read that chapter and learn all about what happened when the when the Americans arrived in Britain. And um, you know, if I had to pick a favorite chapter, I don't know, but I, I might pick that because it was so surprising to me, and it was a history that I had never heard anything about. And neither had people in Britain. Um, you know, this book was published in Britain the year after it was published uh, in this country, and um, you know, it is it it. I, I still get emails all the time from people saying I had no idea that this was a history in my country. So, I, I think we have a question in the audience. There, do we? Yes. Uh, my name is Jeff Nelson. I'm on the uh, muse museum staff here at the Eisenhower. Uh, kind of a follow up to the other Jeff's question um, about the the reaction uh, after the uh, African Americans were stationed in England and and made the surprising discovery for them that race hatred was not the standard go-to. Um, kind of a two-part question. Did you find any, anything in your research that gave a sense that some of the African-Americans chose to stay in England or France after the war instead of return home? And then the second part is you had mentioned that that discovery was kind of an early impetus to, to restart the civil rights movement. Did any of those soldiers become um, major civil rights leaders? The, the the question of um, did any of the soldiers, um, the veterans that I met, uh, why didn't they stay in in Britain or in France where they were also treated quite well? World War One too, the French treated the World War One soldiers exceptionally well. Um, there were certainly some African Americans who stayed, but really, in in perspective, just a few. None from my unit, uh, this battalion that I wrote about, but why didn't they stay if the treatment was so much better? Well, that wasn't home. That wasn't home. And not only did these men want to go home as soon as possible, like, like most soldiers, right? They wanted to get back. They wanted to live. They wanted to get on with their lives. But there is an added dimension when you're talking about African-American soldiers. And this is a distinction that goes all the way back to the Revolutionary War. In every war that this country has ever fought, the black soldier has signed up and signed on, hoping that afterwards there would be more rights. Uh, as we know from the Revolutionary War, that didn't happen, the Civil War. 
Um, yes, slavery ended, but you can, in the talk, I, I, I speak about how within 30 years, the system had ratcheted right back by 1890, the full on Jim Crow system, where those sharecropping farmers who were former slaves uh, were living in a system that that supplanted the one that had been there. And so World War I, uh, I talk in the book about the horrific violence that the World War I soldiers met, especially the ones who kept their uniforms on, uh, many of them because they didn't have other clothes when they returned uh, to the South. Um, and just breathtaking violence, World War II. And one of the saddest stories to me was hearing one of the Tuskegee Airmen tell a story about when they got off the ship. Um, there were two lines, white and colored. And uh, he said, I knew that nothing had changed. And interviewing for a job at Eastern Airlines and leaving the room after and remembering he forgot his um, umbrella or, or something and going back in and seeing that the um, person who interviewed him had thrown his resume in the trash. And she just said, we don't hire Negroes. And so every, at every point, they were disappointed. Did the men of, of my battalion who I interviewed become um, Civil War leaders? Uh, not ones that you would read about, but what did they do? It's interesting. So the epilogue of the book, which also is self-contained, um, even if you don't read the book, you can read what happened to these, some of these stories at the end. While uh, men like my father, um, who was in World War II, were able to use the GI Bill to support themselves, go to college, buy a house with a low a uh, mortgage that was uh, a low rate mortgage guaranteed. Um, well, black soldiers couldn't do that because banks wouldn't lend to them. So you can see how that whole round of wealth that was built after World War II among um, populations uh, did not miss uh, many black soldiers entirely. And Bill Dabney, and um, on the website, I have a, a, a window at the top that says 320th. And if you click it, you'll see a lot of pictures, far more than in the book. And if you click the pictures, you can read the stories. And if you click Bill Dabney's picture, one of the um, uh, Bill's friend Cecil, who was also in a barrage balloon battalion, not the one that went to war, but they had to be very clever. And uh, these two were just quite a team. They were, they were best friends. And they found a way to get financing for their house, right? So were they civil rights leaders? No, but they found a way. They found a way to get a mortgage through a, a black insurance agency in one of the Carolinas. Uh, Cecil found ways to start a business, including like the biggest funeral home um, in, in Roanoke. And, and all these kinds of things. They had to triumph um, in life in ways that um, Oh yeah, I see, scrolling that. They had to triumph, thank you for that. They had to triumph in life um, in ways that, you know, would it make headlines? No, but these were civil rights stories. I mean, they were determined, you know. One more story I'll tell you about that is both Bill Dabney and Henry Parham, Roanoke, Pittsburgh, wanted to learn to be a TV repairman. The TV repair was the trade after the war. This was, but black men, whether it was Pittsburgh and whether it was uh, Virginia, were not training, they, they were not training black men for that. No black men were allowed. Um, and you can read what the men thought of that in the, in the epilogue. But um, Bill Dabney said, I was overqualified to push a mop but I couldn't become a TV repairman. So he started his own carpet and flooring business and he worked well into his 80s at his own business. And they had to find ways. They had to find ways to be successful. Waverly Woodson didn't go to medical school, but he stayed in the medical trade and found a way. And, uh, um, and so for these men, um, life was uh, an exercise in, in what happened when, when 
these men, remember, we call them the greatest generation for a reason. They were strong. And what was really notable to me is how they didn't want their kids to be burdened with these Jim Crow stories. They didn't want their kids to know how hard it was. And so for many of their children, they didn't even know their dads were at D-Day until I showed up asking questions. Um, they were humble and they were resourceful. And um, it was really an honor to know their stories and to retell them, which is what I'm doing. I am not assuming the voice of an African-American man. I would never do that. I wrote this book because nobody else, when I went to the National Archives six months after D-Day anniversary 2009 or so, nobody had asked to see these records. They were quite dusty. And I thought, no one else is doing this. You know, and what do we do as journalists? We interview and we observe and we then come back and we transcribe and then we cull and we pick the best and we make the story. And so that's what I'm doing. So what you're reading is my best effort to tell the stories from their point of view. Um, it also, but obviously, right, written from the perspective of a white woman who didn't know these stories. So. No, it really is a story, Linda, of, of missed opportunities. You know, the 1925 War College uh, report, you know, came about at a time when the military was trying to uh, um, professionalize um, themselves. And they used the, the War College uses as an opportunity to sort of institutionalize that racism. Some um, right in that report, the the GI Bill, um, which many African Americans missed out on, uh, another missed opportunity. But I, I want to thank you for for writing this book. I want to thank you for spending some time with us because what you're doing with this book is giving us an opportunity to. Um, not let another missed opportunity go by. Uh, several times in your talk today, you've mentioned about how uh, you, you didn't know about uh, some of these restrictions. You didn't know about uh, some of the ways that, that these, um, you know, these heroes had been, had been treated. And so opening this up to a new audience, opening this up to a new generation, letting us understand where we've been um, and what these, um, you know, these young men, these young American men went through uh, and suffered through and were discriminated against simply because of the color of their skin, yet while serving their country. Uh, this book is a wonderful book. It's a wonderful opportunity to renew that story. I understand you're having a book signing there, so I, um, I don't want to take up any more of your time. But, um, you know, Linda Herview, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for writing your book. And we look forward to seeing uh, you and the rest of the folks here uh, throughout the rest of the week. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who joined us remotely.